Good to see everyone tonight. How's everybody doing? Good. Hallelujah. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for an opportunity to come into your house. God, to get filled with the wisdom that comes from your word, spiritual wisdom and understanding. Father, we pray that uh, you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that we may know the hope of your calling on our life. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness in our life. We thank you for Jesus and for his blood. Uh, we thank you for your presence in this place. Holy Spirit, teach us for the glory of Jesus and his name. Amen. Amen. So uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to teach again tonight. And uh, I'm excited to share a little bit uh, out of one of my favorite chapters, which is Romans chapter 5. Um, I love that. I love this portion of scripture. It's kind of, I kind of look at it as like a tune-up. You know, a car needs a tune-up every once in a while. You get your plugs changed and make sure everything's running right. And This is a really great portion of scripture for just getting your mind renewed to who we are in Christ. And the biggest thing, I think, for this uh, chapter for me, and it kind of sets it up, is the difference between death in Adam and life in Christ. And for the longest time, guys, and I know there's a lot of people that are still in this place, but for the longest time, I let what the devil did through Adam affect me more than what God did through Christ because I didn't have my mind renewed to it. And so we need to have our minds renewed to this new life we have in Christ. Amen? Amen. So today I'm going to, this, it, this chapter five is uh, broke up into three different segments uh, or sections, if you will, and they are faith triumphs in trouble. That's uh, verses one through five. That's what I'm going to teach on tonight. Christ in our place, verses six uh, through eleven, and then death in Adam and life in Christ, verses twelve through twenty-one. So tonight I'm going to teach on faith triumphs in trouble. How many of you know that uh, we live in a world full of trouble? I mean, we got kids killing kids in drive uh shoot drive-by shootings where innocent kids are getting killed. Uh, we got problems, obviously, we know in our government, we got viruses that are killing people. We got problems and troubles in this world. Thank God for an overcomer. Amen. And thank God that we have that overcomer living on the inside of us. Amen. And so uh, let me read this uh, these five verses. Let's read it together and then I'll, I'll begin. But verse chapter five, Romans, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now I want to start tonight by just kind of breaking down the title of this segment of uh, Romans chapter 5. I like to do that. I like to break down these words. It helps me to understand it better, especially when I when I understand what those words mean and I get that freshness of uh, understanding. So faith, faith is kind of a big word in the church, but what is faith? Yes, we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the biblical definition for it, if you will, or, or uh, revelation of what faith is. Uh, but really, uh, what does it look like in our lives? Uh, if faith triumphs in trouble, what, is that, what does that look like? What is faith? Essentially, it's believing God, right? But it's got to be more than just believing God. Or, you know, James 2.19 says, uh, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. So it's not just, it's just faith isn't just believing that God exists. We know that. And it's not even really just believing in God, if I said, okay, you're, you're, if, if you're in trouble or you've got a trial or tribulation, and, or I do, and we're believing God, well, what are you believing God for? What is, yeah, I'm believing God. Well, what are you believing God for? What is your, what is your access to uh, the power of God? 
And you know where I'm going with this. It's the word, right? It's the promises of God. Faith. I wrote this down. I think it's I think it's it's based on what I'm going to share right now. It's 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 very accurate. But faith is being fully convinced of the promises of God's word and acting on it. So you have to add that, too, because James says that faith without works is dead. Right. So it has to be acted on. Uh, And so we're going to start. Well, let me just let me just. Go right here. So faith is being fully convinced of the promises of God's word and acting on it. This word that chapter five starts with is therefore. Now, you know, you've probably heard this before, but if you see therefore, you have to see what it's there for. And as Paul is writing this letter to the church, remember, it wasn't when he wrote it, it's not broke up in chapters and verses. He's just writing a letter to encourage this this church in Rome. And so he's kind of progressing through these thoughts as, as in, in all this revelation is unfolding as he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit. But when he says, therefore, have him been justified by faith, justified by faith, you got to go up and go into chapter four. And he's talking about Abraham and how Abraham believed God when he promised him a son. And because he believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Right. We've, we've read that and studied that before. Right. Pastor Randy's preached on that many times. But verse, uh, let's start with verse 19, and let's just, let's just examine the therefore as we start this. So this is talking about Abraham, and actually, let me start with 17. So he says, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him uh, whom he believed, Abraham, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, this is talking about Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations here's the key according to what was spoken according to what was spoken or in agreement with what was spoken so shall your descendants be and not being weak in faith he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of sarah's womb He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. I'll come back to that. And here it is. And being fully convinced that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So God promised Abraham uh, a son, which was Isaac, right? But the Bible says that being not weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. So Abraham had a lot of, a lot of uh, adversity as he was purposing to believe God. He had a lot of adversity to, to get through and to persevere through. His own natural knowledge of what his body, where his body was in the, in the, in the time of his age and also Sarah's. Uh, he had uh, people, I'm sure, that were trying to speak into his life. But God gave Abraham a, a, a lot of help. And one of the things that God did for Abraham was he changed his name. And when God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham, which means father of many, a father of many nations, every time, watch this, every time Abraham introduced himself to somebody, he said, hi, I'm the father of many nations. So he was already speaking out the promises of God just in introducing himself. So he was already already working that faith as he was believing God. God also gave him uh, promises in his word to say, and he said, Abraham, look at the stars in the sky. If you can count the stars in the sky, so shall your descendants be. Well, look at the stars in the sky. I mean, there's too many to count. Uh, That's probably very encouraging to him. Man, that's how many my descendants are going to be. Abraham, look at the sand of the sea. Look at the sand of the seashore. If you can count the grains of sand, that's how much your descendants will be. Well, I can't do that. They're just, they're just, they're numerous. So encouraging. So every time Abraham looks up at the sky at night, he's reminded of that promise, right? Every time. And every time Abraham's walking through the, you know, through the the dry land or whatever, and, and he's coming home and he's dusting the sand off his sandals, he's thinking of that promise. Every grain, of, can you count every grain of sand? No. So So God gave Abraham a lot to work with, but it says in being not weak in faith, he did not consider. That means to ponder, to think on, to deliberate. He knew he was old, but he still chose. That's that's a 
key word. He chose to believe God's word, contrary to hope. In hope, believed. His own body already dead since Sarah was about, and since uh, he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise, I'll make you a father of many nations of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So at some point, you, you got to think, they had a conversation, and, and, and Abraham saying to Sarah, Sarah, look, now God's promised us this son. I'm, I'm too old to naturally have kids, and you're past the age of childbearing, so this has got to be a miracle from God. So we need to believe God. We need to dig our heels in. We need to believe God. And whatever we can do to believe God, that's what we need to do. And they did. They did. And it says it was accounted to him for righteousness. So when it says, therefore, that's what, that's what he's talking about. And it says, uh, and let me just move on right here. It says, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, righteousness, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So faith is being fully convinced of the promises of God's word and acting on it. All right, let's look at triumph. I love this word. It means to be victorious. Triumph means to be victorious. Second, and it's, 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 it means actually more than that, and I'll show you, but 2 Corinthians 2.14 says that God always, always leads us in triumph through Christ Jesus. That word triumph, it actually means a celebratory processional. It's a, it's, if, if you will, it's a parade of victory in Christ. And we're right there with him. God always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ Jesus. You kind of get this picture of Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, where it says, he comes in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. And behind him are the armies of heaven clothed in clean white linen. That processional, that victorious, and that's the revelation that God wants us to have, that he's, that he's given us victory in Christ, and everything that Christ has obtained through the cross, through the shedding of his blood, uh, through the resurrection, Everything that he has obtained, we're a joint heir of. We're joint heirs with Christ. Everything that he has, we have access to. Uh, Jesus says, all that the Father has in mine, and the Holy Spirit will take of what is mine, and he'll declare it to you. So everything that Jesus has and has, has purchased by his blood, we have access to, because we have, we, we, we have access to his name. In the name of Jesus, we can ask the Father and we can receive, Amen. So he is the overcomer, and we overcome because he is the overcomer. Jesus said in, in John 16, 33, he says, uh, I've told you these things so that my peace may be in you. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And because he's overcome the world, we can be overcomers. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes this world. If you've been born of God, raise your hand. If you're born again. So you overcome this world. This is the victory that overcomes this world. Say it with me. Even our faith. Our faith. Faith triumphs in trouble. Triumphal procession. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. And verse 5 is really important. It says, who is he or she who overcomes this world? Watch this. But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, why does he say the Son of God? Why does he say he that believes that Jesus is the Savior of the world or the healer or the deliverer? Uh, why does he say the Son? And I asked myself that one time because it's a question. Who is he who overcomes the world? I mean, when you read in the Bible, if it's a question, think about it. And he gives us the answer. He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Why is it so important to believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you ever thought about that? Because the first Son of God lost his identity. And I'll talk about that. Adam, the first son. Jesus is the second Adam who secured his identity, and because of that, we have identity with Christ. And guess what that is? Sonship identity. John chapter 8. He who sins is a slave of sin, and a slave doesn't abide in the house forever, 
But guess what? A son, capital S, abides forever. And if the son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. Triumphal procession in Christ. God wants to have this. God wants us and wills for us to have this victorious revelation of victory in Christ. Does it mean everything, all, does it mean everything always goes the way that we want? And, you know, it's coming up roses 24-7? No. But we can have faith triumphs in troubles. We can have victory even in the tribulation and in the trials. And as Jesus said, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. That's the victory because I have overcome the world. That's triumph. That's that word triumph. It's, 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 it's a celebratory processional of victory in Christ. What are we celebrating? Well, I kind of just gave it away, but we're celebrating the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, who uh, in his, we're celebrating the King of kings, Jesus Christ, and his overcoming victory over this world of sin and death. And because he has the victory, we have the victory, right? That's what we're celebrating. That's that triumph word. It's awesome. All right, trouble. Trouble's pretty easy uh, to, to kind of break down. I looked this up, and it's kind of, it was kind of comical to me, but I looked up the word trouble, and, and uh, in, big, in big letters, all caps, it said problems. <laughs> problems. And then it gives just this, this myriad of, and I'll just read some of them, Difficulties, issues, bothers, inconveniences, worries, anxieties, distresses, concerns, disquietness, uneasiness, irritation, vexation, annoyance, stress, agitation, harassment, unpleasantness, hassles. Uh, it, I mean, just on and on. And there's more. Webster's definition, I like this. It says a state or condition of distress, annoyance, or difficulty. Kind of simple, breaks it all down. I like that. Proverbs 11.8 says the righteous is delivered out of trouble. Now that word, that the translation of that word is, is, is distress, affliction, adversity, and here's the word, tribulations. Trouble is problems. Remember when Joe McGee was here, he said, we're not, he said, we're, we're uh, Jesus said that you were the uh, 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 peacemakers. Problem solvers. That's right. Problem solvers. There's problems in that world because it's a world full of problems. And we're the problem solvers. We because we have. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we have the answer. John again, John 16, 33. I've told you these things. So in me, you may have peace. The only way we're going to have peace is in Christ. In Christ is the only way we're going to have peace. So in me, you will have peace. Uh, in this world, you will have tribulations. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now, trouble, I, I just want to kind of move on a little bit more into this word trouble. Trouble, Jesus said, again, I'll go back to that scripture. I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And I think one of the things that have really helped me in my walk with the Lord, and quite honestly, in my effectiveness to be victorious in trials and tribulations and things like that, is to know where the battle lines are. Jesus says you will have tribulation in this world, but he's not bringing the tribulations to us. He's not the one orchestrating the tribulations. He's not the one bringing the problems into our life. He's not the troublemaker. You ever have you, you ever talk to your kids and say, you know, don't, don't hang out with troublemakers. They're bad news. You just know, you know a troublemaker. My wife has troublemakers on her bus. Ask her. <laughs> There's troublemakers. God's, God's not the author of troublemaking. And I want to give you a scripture. Just You may be thinking, oh, Sean, I don't know about that. But uh, Matthew 6, 34 Jesus says, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you the King James here because it makes my point. He says, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And if you've got the New King James Version, it's, it's going to say uh, the trouble, 
thereof. Isn't that what it says? The trouble. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that what it says? Evil. Evil. What does James say? Let no one say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone with evil. But guess what, guys? We live in a fallen world. We live in a dark, sinful world, and we're light in a dark world. We're salt in a world that's decaying and going to, uh, uh, you know, just just desecrating at, at, at mock speed. Uh, and we're the we're the salt and the light of this of this of this world. Jesus said in John 17, he said, Father, don't take them out of the world. They're the light of the world. Don't take them out of the world. Don't take them out of the world. They're the salt of the earth. Don't take them out of the world. They got work to do. Don't take them out of the world. I need to shine through them. He says, don't take them out of the world. I don't pray that you take them out of the world. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. That's a key word, of. We're in the world, but we're not of it. He says, keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one who is the God of this world. Keep them from the evil one. How? Set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So the troubles in our lives are not, are not, from God, they're because we live in this fallen world. If you want to blame somebody, blame Adam. Right? This same, in the same chapter, verse 12, therefore just as through one man sin entered the world, that's where problems came from, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So faith triumphs in trouble. We broke that down. Now let me, let me, let me go. That was just my intro. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you don't see, if you and I don't see our peace with God, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through this, but our, our uh, united oneness and in, in fellowship and covenant with God, we're not going to do well when it comes to trials and tribulations in this world. We've got to see our identity, and that's what Paul's getting at. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can look at that word justified. I'm going to pull apart some of these words. Justified, you can look at that as uh, just the layman's definition is just as I've never sinned. Therefore, having been justified by... Remember, we've got three parts of our salvation. Justification, uh, sanctification and glorification justification is something that's already done it's a done deal bible says in ephesians that we're sealed by the holy spirit until the day of redemption when god takes redeems his purchased possession we're sealed uh hebrews 10 14 says jesus has perfected forever those who are being sanctified so justification is something that's already done and we would here's one thing i just want to encourage you guys with whenever you see a past tense in the scriptures you should underline it, circle it, just make a note of it, because it says, having been justified. See, the devil will play games when you'll say, uh, you think you're really, are you really saved? You know, and they'll start getting that, getting those doubts in there just because, you know, you may not be acting right. You may not be living right. You may not be tracking with God the way you should. But this says, having been justified by faith. Well, when was that? When you confess Jesus Christ with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You were saved the day you got regenerated in the spirit. You got to know that. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word peace, I love this. That word peace means prosperity, quietness, rest. And, I, and this is the big one, to set it one again. Prosperity. What do you mean, Sean? Like the prosperity gospel? No, I mean like prosperity. Like the life of God is in you and it's flowing in you and through you. Prosperity. You know, prosperity isn't a bad word. Uh, Randy just taught on this last week, but but James says, uh, I mean, that third John verse two says, "Beloved, I wish above all else that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers." So it has to do with what our mind is renewed to, right? That's how we experience the prosperity of God, or one of part of the way that we do. Bible says, and I think it's Psalms, that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Why? Because God 
wants us to have his life in us and flowing through us. Prosperity, quietness, rest. You know what, you know what people would give for the quietness and the peace of God? This peace that peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? You know what people would give to wake up in the morning and not have to take pills and, and not have to, you know, uh, do yoga or, or whatever it is to get, get that quietness and rest? I mean, they'd probably give, give anything for that. We have it. We have it. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 23 that uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters quietness, rest. He leads me beside still waters. But guess what? If he's going to lead us, we've got to follow. There's nothing like getting in your word. And, 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 and I love to think about it this way. I get in the word and I get in my quiet place. I got my coffee in the morning and uh, the dogs have, are all calmed down, hopefully, and I can, I can concentrate, but I got my coffee and, uh, and I'm drinking of that water of the word. I'm sitting with Jesus. I'm at rest. I'm and I'm in that quiet place. He's led me beside those streams of, of water. And, and, I'm, and I'm taking that time to get rejuvenated and, re, and, and get my mind renewed. And it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. And we have that access 24, 24-7. Gosh, that's good. But it means oneness. It means to set it one again. Again? Set it one again? Why again? Because when God created Adam and breathed into him the breath of life, Adam had unbroken, unhindered fellowship with God in the spirit. The Bible says in Genesis that they, God walked with them and met with them in the cool of the evening. And he fellowshiped with them until Adam fell. And then he hid from God and that fellowship was, was broken. It was, it, was, it was damaged. It was they were no longer one. This says, set it one again. This peace through Jesus Christ sets us at one again with God. Guys, that's so important. I'm going to tell you something. I, I picked this up from Adrian Rogers, and this was so good. I was on my way home. Shannon and I were coming home from somewhere. It was when I was still up north, and I was just starting to get the word in me and uh, listening to you know, people like Andrew and things like that. And I was on the, I was flipping the radio, and I heard this guy, and I'd never heard Adrian Rogers before. But I think the teaching was the desolation of your house, or your house is left desolate. I looked for it last night, I couldn't find it. But in this, I picked this up from him. In this, he talks about how before Adam sinned, he was innocent. He was in a state of innocence, like he had he. He never sinned. He was in a state of innocence and he had unbroken, unhindered fellowship with God until he transgressed. God said, if you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Who you are in me will surely die, will be separated. And he did. And Adam was no longer innocent. He was guilty. And you all know the story. God took animal skins and in that is the is the shedding of blood and, and God covered them when they tried to cover themselves. But what did Adam do when he when he sinned? He ran and hid, right? He ran and hid. And the Bible says that he heard. They heard God walking in the garden. Well, God doesn't have a body. So how they hear God walking in the garden? I don't know. I don't know. But. I'm telling you, there was a separation there. And, and you know the story. God said, uh, Adam said, I, I, I hid because I was naked. Well, who told you were naked? Did you eat of that tree? Uh-uh. Yes, I did. And so, but watch this. So Adam was innocent, and then he, he transgressed, and, and he was separated from God. That's the, that's the first son of God. If you go to Matthew's genealogy, it says Adam. The last one, it says Adam, the son of God. That's why it's important to believe Jesus is the son of God. So now, in Christ, we have, in Christ, I don't want to burst your bubble here, but we're not innocent. We've all broken God's law. We've all transgressed God's law. James says if you've broken one law, you're guilty of all. 
We've all, we've all broken the law. We're not innocent. We're, we're not innocent. Jesus, Jesus, the blood of Jesus, God covered us with the blood of Jesus. We're not innocent. But we are blameless and above reproach in his sight through Jesus. But here's the power of that. Even though we sin, which we do, and some very well, even though we transgress still, and we're not innocent, we're still covered by the blood. And here it is. We still have unbroken, unhindered fellowship with God because he sees us in Christ. Jesus presents us that way. Here's the scripture, Jude chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory, the Father, with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Uh, in Colossians, Paul writes pretty much the, along those same lines. He says, Jesus, uh, we were dead and we were, uh, we were aliens of God through the wicked works of our mind. And, and now Jesus has, has uh, let me go to it so I don't mess that up. Colossians chapter 1. Uh, or verse 21, and you who were once alienated and enemies in, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now, now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith and grounded steadfast and are not moved away by the hope of the gospel. So my point is in saying all that is that we have a uh, position in Christ, even though we still mess up, even though we still uh, uh, sin in Christ, that we still have unbroken, unhindered uh, fellowship with God and access to the throne of grace that we're, that, that we're going to read right now. That's a good place for an amen right there. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's that oneness. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians, uh, second, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, uh, 6, 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So it's in the spirit that we have this in Christ. We're in Christ. He's in us. And we have this oneness with God. All right, let me move on. Through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Notice it says, been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people are trying to get oneness with God by things like, and I don't want to, I don't want to step on anybody's toes here, but, uh, but you know, Eastern religion and, and yoga. I mean, you know what yoga means? It means one, it means uh, one with God. So if you're into yoga, I would, I would be praying about that. But my point is, is that we have it, guys. We have this oneness with God through Jesus. Verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This word access, this is, a, this is a, a, an exciting part and a fun part for me to talk about. Access, it's the word that we get admission from. Admission from, and admission means it, it's an entrance fee that's paid so that we can enter into some place. Right? He says, we have access by faith into this grace. So he's talking about the grace of God. Admission, it's an entrance fee. When I was a kid, uh, one of my fondest memories, some of my fondest memories was going to this place called Rocky Point Park. It was an amusement park off of, uh, in Rhode Island. It was right on the ocean. When you went up on the high roller coasters, you could see the ocean. It was, it was crazy. But uh, we'd go there, and that was one of my favorite places to go as a kid. My grandparents lived close by, so my, my parents would take us to our grandparents. We'd visit, and then we'd go to Rocky Point. And uh, it was a rarity, but it was one of my favorite places to go. And so we'd get there, and we'd get up to the ticket booth, and Dad would pay the entrance fee. And we'd go into the park, and we'd have, we'd have access to the full, fullness of that park, all the fun we wanted to have, all, all the thrill rides. Anything that we wanted to do, we had access through that entrance fee that was paid. Paul's saying we have access by faith into his grace by which we stand. You know, the grace of God is like a wonderland of the kingdom of God. That's, that's everything that God is through his grace. 
I mean, everything that God is and everything that God gives us through his grace. And it's not just, it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just prosperity stuff. I mean, the grace of God teaches us not to sin. We need that grace, right? The grace of God teaches us how to live godly in this present world. But the grace of, and the grace of God is also a thrill ride. You know, the first time I get up here to, to teach or anywhere to teach, it's, it's thrilling. It's, it's, it's where I need the comforter because I'm uncomfortable. It's where, and we have those times in our lives where, man, journeying with God and tracking with God is like riding on a roller coaster. You don't know where you're going to go, but God, I'm in, and, you're, and, and, and let's go, you know? And you can, and you can hold on, and, and, and God will take you through it, but, but it's thrilling. And that's the grace of God, guys. It's this wide open, you know, the, Jesus says, uh, strive to enter into the kingdom. For narrow is the, the gate and difficult is the way into eternal life. Yes, that road is narrow and that, and that gate is narrow. But once you're in, man, it is wide open. Wide open with the promises of God, the, uh, the love of God, all the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, just wide open and, and enjoyable. The Bible says there's fullness of joy in His presence. That's the grace of God. The grace of God is, is, is that overflowing cup that we get to, that we get to take, partake of every day of his grace. My cup overflows. You know, this world that's full of problems out here, there's two perspectives that they go by. It's the pessimistic perspective, and they say, well, the glass is half full. Even they're lost people, and they have somewhat of a, uh, you know, an idea of what, what's, uh, what they perceive as, you know, uh, negative or positive, and they'll say, well, the glass is half, they'll think the glass is half full, and they're always kind of negative and always trying to shoot holes in things, and that's what we call a pessimist. And then the other one is a, an optimist, and they see the glass half full. And that's good, I guess. You know, they're kind of optimistic, and they're hopeful. And But we as Christians, our cup runs over. We have an overflowing cup of salvation, the Bible says. If I had this water, right, this, this bottle right here, it's not a big bottle. There's a little bit of water in it, and I need to get another one because I'm thirsty. But how do we know that this is full? What's the, what's the overall visual that this would be full? It would start overflowing. If you tried to put any more in it, if it was full and you thought it was full, well, to test that, you gotta put, if you put more in it, it would start overflowing. That's what God says we're supposed to do. Overflow. We're supposed to be so full of him that it overflows. And that's that cup. My cup overflows. That's the grace of God. We have access to that. I remember reading John chapter 24. Uh, John, John chapter 4 one time where the woman said, uh, you have nothing to draw with. Where are you going to get this water? And, and he says, uh, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst and in fact, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water bubbling up into everlasting life. And as I read that, I felt like the Holy Spirit was showing me that, that little, that, that little uh, illustration that I just gave you. The door to the kingdom is so narrow and very few, very few find it. That means you've got to look for it. But the, but the wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to uh, destruction and many enter in by it. But you've got to find the kingdom of, kingdom of God. You've got to be looking for it. But it's narrow, but inside it's wide open. And the, and the promises and the possibilities of God and the, and the journey with God in this life, and man, it should be an enjoyable experience. It should be a, it should be a thrill ride. It should be, it should be a wonder, a, a wonderland of His grace that we get to access every day. And we do. So it says we have faith into this grace in which we stand. That, that word stand, that's the same word that we see in Ephesians where it said, after you've done everything to stand, stand, therefore, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. All this armor of God, stand, stand ready, stand, stand in, a, in, a, in, a, in a victorious uh, stand to say, I'm not moving off of the word of God through whom we have access by faith. Remember, we're talking about faith triumphs in trouble. When you're going to need grace, which is help from God. When are you going to need that? When do I need that? Through troubles, through trials, through tribulations, right? 
That's what he's saying. Because of we have oneness with God, we have access by faith into this grace. What was Abraham's problem? If he's, saying, if he's using Abraham, what was Abraham's problem? He had to believe God through all that adversity. That was, that was probably hard. That was definitely hard. I'm sure. We don't know what the conversations were like, but we don't, and we don't know what he went through. But to stand, to, to stand on that promise, I'm sure that was, that was very challenging. But he did it. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, God, and God fulfilled his word. So we have hope. It says we, have, we stand and, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Well, what's that mean? It's the expectation of what I'm believing for. Hope is expectation. An expectation of what we're believing God for. When we're talking about trials and tribulations, we're asking God for deliverance. We're asking God. We're praying for healing. We're praying for prosperity. We're praying to get out of financial difficulties. We're praying for our kids. We're praying for our loved ones. We got a word from God. uh, And we're standing on the word. And we're accessing this grace by faith in which we stand. Remember, Hebrews says we we can... Boldly come to the throne room of what? Grace. To find what? To obtain mercy and find grace in our time of what? Need. Our time of need. The time of need when we're having troubles and triumphs uh, tri- and tribulations. And, uh, and trials. This wonderland of God's grace that we've been, that we've been given is, is just incredible. And here's something that you need to see and I need to remember is if you go over here in, in verse 17, it's not, just, it's not just grace, it's abundance of grace. For if by one man's offense, death reigned, verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, that's talking about Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. That sounds like a uh, that that sounds like a, a a triumphal procession of victory right there. Will reign in life, abundance of grace. You know, five times this is kind of uh, uh, viewed as the much more chapter. Five times in this chapter, he uses much more. In 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 the numerality, numeral, uh, you know. Things of the word of God. Five is the number of grace. Abundance of grace. And we have it. All right. And it's but it's the hope is the expectation of what I'm believing God for. It's uh, it's actually uh, let me find my notes here. It's actually a. An intis to anticipate with pleasure an expectation or confidence in God's word. Jesus said it this way. He said, Mark eleven twenty four. 24, he says, whatsoever you ask for in prayer, believe you receive it when you pray and it shall be yours. So if we believe we receive it when we pray, then we're probably going to be starting rejoicing about it before we even receive it because we know it's coming. We know it's coming. And that's what God's saying here through Paul, this triumphal procession that I have it. Bible says in in 1 John uh, 5.14, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask according to his will, we know uh, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, guess what? We know we have the petitions that we've asked for. So if I know it's coming, man, I'm rejoicing already. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I may not know when it's coming, but it's coming. Because God said it's coming. So it's this, it's this anticipation, expectation of what we're believing for. All right, verse 3. And not only that, if that wasn't good enough, Paul's saying, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. What time is it? I want to spend a little bit of time here. Now, what does this mean, we glory in tribulation? We glory in tribulation. Here's what I've come up with. It's pretty simple. We rejoice. 
We rejoice in tribulations. Why do we rejoice in tribulations? Well, it's, a, it's what James says. Consider it pure joy when you face many uh, trials of many kinds. Why? Why do we rejoice? One, because we know if God is for us, who can be against us? We know that God's with us. We know that Christ is, is, is in us. And we know that we have an overcomer, but we rejoice. And he goes on to say it, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance because it's a chance to grow. We rejoice because it's an opportunity to release our faith and to see the word work in our lives. If you don't test the word, you'll never know if it works. And me neither. We're supposed to prove God's will by the renewing of our mind and the transformation. So Paul says in Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what? So that you can prove God's will, his good, his good, acceptable, and perfect, perfect will. I know that's not something that's a, that's a shouting, a, 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 a shouting revelation, but I'm telling you, that's, that's what it is. We glory in tribulations. Again, I'll say this again. We don't, we don't thank God for the problem. He's not the troublemaker. We thank God for the answer to the problem. We thank God that we have the victory through the problem. We thank God for the overcoming power of Christ in us. The grace of God. That's what we're, that's what we're, that's what we're glorying in. We're glorying in tribulations because it's 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 going to be an opportunity for us to grow. And and I'll just let me just use this scripture because it's really it's really good. But um, and, and I said glo to glory in tribulations means to rejoice. Philippians chapter four. What does Paul say? He says rejoice in the Lord. Philippians four four rejoice in the Lord. So you're rejoicing in your oneness with God because. As you're going through this, you need to know that Jesus is in the boat with you. You got to. That's what you're rejoicing in, and he's not gonna. He, he's not gonna fail you. He's not. He knows what's going on. He sees everything, and if you're tracking with God, he's gonna. You're gonna overcome through through that through that oneness and through that believing in His Word and and releasing your faith. And God's not gonna fail you. He he, he he'll never fail you. But that's what we're rejoicing in. Rejoice in the Lord when? When everything's going well? In tribulations? Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And just in case you missed it, again, I say rejoice. <laughs> he says, let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition. Here's the key. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Father, I'm dealing with this. The doctor has said I got cancer and it's unoperable. It's, it's stage four. Uh, present your request to God. Father, I thank you that through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, your word says that he himself bore his sins in my body on the tree so that I haven't died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes I was healed. God, your word says that you sent forth your word and you healed me and delivered me from all destruction. Father, my kids are on drugs. How do I, what do I do, God? What do I do? Uh, Father, your word says in Psalms 512 that you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor and you'll surround them as with a shield. You see, you see where I'm going? That's, that, that's the thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. You're, you're telling, you're saying to God, God, you've already given me the answer to this problem and it's in your word. And I'm taking you at your word, God, and you, you promised this, and I'm going to, by faith, believe it, and I'm going to, and I'm going to stand on it. I forgot who it was. I think it was Tony Evans when we were going through Kingdom Man. He said this, and I loved it. He said, God loves to be caught in a promise. God loves, your father loves to be caught in a promise. Sometimes I'll tell him, I'll tell Case, and he'll, he'll be like, Dad, you want to go to Para? And I'll be tired, man, just. Uh, I'll be I'll be sitting on the chair and and my body's just I'm I'm tired. I said like, uh, I'm not today, Casey. And I promise we'll go tomorrow. They'll come home from school and he hadn't forgotten that promise. They'll come home from school and I said, Dad, you ready? And I was like, Oh, 
Now, I don't like to be caught in a promise, but God loves to be caught in a promise. God loves to be caught in a promise because it's his word and it's his promise to us. And he wants us, listen, he wants us to know what his word says so we can believe it and he can perform it. Jeremiah 1.12, I'm watching over my word to perform it. See, you gotta, we got to have the word mixed in this. The Bible says that the, the gospel was preached to the Israelites, but it didn't profit them nothing, having not been mixed, in, mixed with faith in them that heard it. Faith is being fully convinced in the promises of God's word and acting on it. And a lot of times that acting on it is, is just doing something to stir yourself up to say, God, I'm believing for this. I'm believing for this. I don't care if it's, if it's you know, you, you pray the word, you speak the word over your problem, whatever it is, uh, but you do what the word says. If, 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 it's, if it's for healing, you lay hands on, lay hands on, you have somebody lay hands on, you just do what God's word says. If it's for prosperity, uh, given, it shall be given to you. Pr uh, press down and running over. And, and if, if it's for peace of mind, uh, set your heart on things above. I mean, there's something that we can always do to activate our faith in God's word. And when we're going through, well, if we want faith to triumph in troubles, we've got to know that. And we've got to, we've got to do, put that effort. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, make every effort to enter into that rest. We've got to be diligent in that. But watch this. Not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing, so you've got to know this, that tribulation produces perseverance. And I'm just going to break this down real quick, and then we'll be done. Perseverance, tribulation, we, we've already established that. That's problems, it's trials, it's all those things. Tribulation produces perseverance. What's perseverance? What did you say? The King James says patience. Patience, it's patience in the long run. It's patience as you're standing on the word and somebody's saying, Sean, it's not working, it's not working. It's going to work. The word works if you work it. God's going to come through. He's already promised it and I believe it and I'm already rejoicing about it. But it's patience. It means endurance, steadfastness. We have need of endurance. How many can agree that we have need of endurance? We got to get our minds renewed to what God says about his word. Because a lot of times we talk just in the physical realm. We talk just natural things and we forget to trump everything with God's word. And then we leave God out of it because of that. We got to we got to we got to cap everything off with God's word. Yes, this is going on, but what does God's word say? And we, we got it by faith. That, that's, that's, part of our, that's part of our faith uh, nature in Christ. We, that, that's what we've got to do. Thank you, Lord. When Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house, and his servant, Jairus' servant, came and he says, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your little girl is dead. Jesus turned right around to Jairus and he says, don't fear, only believe. Now that was a fact. But facts are facts. It ain't over till truth is spoken. And Jesus looked at me and says, don't fear, only believe. Only believe what, Jesus? Jairus, believe what you asked me for. Lord, my little girl is sick and at home. Come lay your hands on her and she'll be healed. Believe, only believe. So even Jesus did it. Trumping everything with God's word. Perseverance. So that's, that's perseverance. Perseverance uh, leads to, uh, produces character. What's character? I'll just give you the King James. It's experience. That's what's going to build character is experience. It's, it's, it's this place in our life where we've, man, we've, we've dug our heels in. We've stood on God's word. And even when it looked like nothing was going to happen, we stood on God's word and we stood and we stood and we believed and God came through. And now we've got experience. We've got we've got we've grown from 30 to maybe 50 or or 60 and the, and the seeds working and the words germinating in us and it's starting to work in our life. And we're starting to see the, the fruition of what we've believed for in, in, in God's word. It's it's experience. It's experience. It's it's. 
It's that intimate knowing God through, his, through, the, through, this, uh, through this journey of knowing him. And Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But it really means to test by trusting. To test by trusting. How are we going to trust what God's word says is true? Apply it to your situation. We got to prove it. We got to test it. We got to do that. Character produces hope. What is hope? I already told you that. It's to anticipate with pleasure and expectation and confidence. So this is a building, this is a growth development as we're, as we're releasing our faith in, in, this, in triumphing and in, in, in wanting our faith to triumph in, trouble, in troubles. This is a growth uh, producing this growth in us from going from perseverance and character and character hope. And hope is so important, guys. You know, the Bible says that, that the unbelievers are without God and no hope in this world. And yet we have the, uh, we have the, uh, the hope of glory living on the inside of us. And when they're looking for hope, he's in us. And they're looking at our lives and they're looking, how are you going to respond to this, Sean? Your father's dying. How are you going to respond to this? Uh, you, you're, uh, so-and-so is in trouble. Uh, you, your kid's on drugs. How are you going to respond to this? Uh, your wife left you. How are you going to respond? That's not me. I'm just giving examples. Your wife left you. How are you going to respond to this? And they're watching. And they're watching. They're looking for where's Sean draw his hope from? Where's Randy draw his hope from? They're looking. They're watching. Jesus said, they'll see your good works and they'll glorify your Father in heaven. Verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been, there's another past tense, poured out or shed abroad, some versions say, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So two sets of words there talk about the past tense. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. But it says hope doesn't disappoint. What does that mean, hope doesn't disappoint? It means I'll never be disappointed in trusting God. Proverbs chapter 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire comes, it's a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. What's that mean? When you, you, you kind of wishing and hoping and praying and nothing's really happening and you're not, you don't really have this, this relationship with God. It's hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you don't guard your heart and, and you don't guard that word, if you don't if you don't hold on to that word and don't let anything take it, the Bible says that the persecutions of this world come to steal the word. If you don't hold on to it, your hope's going to your hope's going to be deferred. You're going to put a time on something. If you put a time on something, Satan's going to say, "Well, I'll just wait till they have that." To, if it doesn't happen here, I'm going to I'm going to give up. Well, if you've got an out, then you've just made yourself vulnerable to the enemy. Because because faith is not a place in time; it's a position that we have in Christ. It's a position that we have in Christ. So hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been shed abroad or poured out in my hearts. What's that mean? It means that God, I can trust God and I'll never put God on trial for something that's going on in my life. Especially, uh, and here's how I know if it's, it, it, well, I'm not going to go into that, but I'll never put God on trial. I'll never say, God, if you love me, how come this is happening? God, why this? Or how come this? I, I, I've served you. I've, I've, I'll never put God on trial like that because I have this revelation of God's love. Well, what's that, Sean? What do you mean? First John three sixteen. I know the love of God because he gave his life for me. And if he gave his life for me, certainly he's going to give me everything else that I need to finish my race that he's marked out for me. I don't have everything that I want, but I'll have everything I need. And if I seek his kingdom first, I'm promised that. And so I, I'm, I'll never put God on trial. The love of God has been poured out. Romans 8.32 says, If God who did not spare his son but gave him up for us all, how shall he not along with him freely give us all things? All things? That sounds like prosperity, Sean. No, all things. Everything that you and I need to finish our race that he's marked out for us. That's what that means. 
He says it's been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Guys, this is why, this is why understanding the role of the Holy Spirit is so important in a, in a believer's walk. Because he's the one that's, that's, that's given us this revelation of God's love. It says the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. He's the one that we're fellowshipping with on this earth. He's the one that glorifies Jesus. He's the one that takes of Jesus and, 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 and declares it to us. He's the one that's our teacher. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, the comforter whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance everything I have spoken. He's the one that brings the word back to us. He's the one that just reminded me of that thing about Jairus so I could add that into this message. I mean, he's the one that's, that's in us and he's speaking with us and he's, and he's talking to us. And he just wants us to obey. And and when we track with God that way, the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Galatians 5.25, since we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Faith triumphs in troubles. I hope you got something tonight. Love you guys.